Thank you, Seth, and good morning. We are in the book of Galatians, and we are looking at chapter 3 this morning. We're going to take a lengthy passage, uh, verses 1 through 14, but it, it is a complete passage, and I want to deal with it all in one, uh, one shot. So, Galatians 3, beginning with verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You had a sense of the emotion of the apostle at this time of this writing of the, of the epistle and the uh, great amount of Old Testament scripture he uses to support his case. Well, we'll deal with all of that in, in just a moment. But let's ask the Lord to bless our time of study together. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege it is to be with your people. Uh, that that is something that uh, we can say every Sunday morning. But it's true, and it's, this is a, a great fellowship. It's a supernatural fellowship. It's what you have produced. You have brought us to yourself by your sovereign grace. You purchased us by the work of your Son. The Spirit drew us. We've been chosen. We've been redeemed. We've been brought to you. We've been brought to this place. It's a work of grace. And you keep us. And we're certainly reminded of that from this passage. And as we consider these Galatians who had great experiences in the gospel, who had been blessed by you, and, and yet through it all became enamored of a false gospel. And how easy it would be for us to do that as well, Lord. But we are debtors to mercy alone. We are dependent upon you for your grace and you keep us. But we should be reminded as we consider this of the dangers spiritually to us. And we're always in dangerous ground. We are in a spiritual battle constantly. And we can only stand by your grace. And we need to look to you and keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And faith is the great subject 
this morning of this text. Help us to learn it. Help us to understand it. Help us to, again, know more about this great doctrine of justification. This great doctrine of grace. So Lord, we look to you to bless us. May the Spirit of God teach us and build us up in the faith. Strengthen us for this day and the next day, the week to come. And Father, we look to you to bless in that way spiritually. But we also need your blessings materially. We pray for our health physically. We pray for those that are recovering from surgeries. We are thankful for the good recoveries of Cindy and Judy and pray you continue to bless them. We pray that you'd protect Margaret and Madeline and Audrey. And Father, we pray especially at this time for Pat Austin. Bless her with healing. Encourage her. Bless those that visit her. Father, what good fellowship we can have with her and that she has with you. And I pray that you would make your presence known in a special way to Pat. And bless Danny Deppel, Father. We know he is in a, a difficult situation physically with, and, and in great pain. And I pray that you give him relief from that. Give him encouragement. Father, thank you for this time together, this rich time of uh, reading, this text, and then now having the opportunity to consider it in some depth. We pray that you would bless us as we do that. And to do that, and to do it well, and to do it worshipfully, we pray that you would bless us now as we sing our next hymn, prepare our hearts for a time of study and worship together. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In 1975, a Dutchman entered the Rijksmuseum, armed with a bread knife, went to Rembrandt's masterpiece, The Night Watch, and began slashing. When he was finally subdued, he explained that he was only doing the Lord's work. The director of the museum disagreed. He called the man a lunatic. Others agreed he was placed in an asylum. Something similar happened in Galatia. Men from Jerusalem came there and wrecked the gospel with what amounted to a bread knife, a ceremony, circumcision, saying it was necessary for salvation. They claimed they were only restoring the gospel to its original meaning and doing the Lord's work. And many young believers in Galatia were swayed by them. Paul was amazed at their gullibility. What, what these men of the law were doing was defacing the greatest work in the universe. When Christ died, he said, it is finished. Nothing can be added to what he has done. What these Judaizers were doing to the gospel was as maniacal as slashing a masterpiece. And the men of Galatia should have known better. Paul said that. He began chapter 3, you foolish Galatians. Now the Greek text has, oh foolish Galatians. The, the emotion in the, the rebuke here is expressed in that little word, oh. Their fascination with the law was something new and completely irrational. That's the sense of the word foolish. The law was never given as a way of salvation. It was given for the purpose of exposing sin and showing people their need of salvation. Paul explains that later in, in verse 19. Its function has been compared to that of a mirror. A mirror helps us see a smudge of dirt on our face, but it doesn't cleanse it. It only exposes the problem so that we can then wash it away. And that's what the law does. It exposes sin so that we can see the problem and flee to the Savior for cleansing. Donald Gray Barnhouse said, trying to save oneself by keeping the law is like a person who looks in a mirror, sees the dirt, and then tries to remove it by rubbing the mirror on his face. Now, if we saw a person doing that, we would think that he was foolish. Foolish. 
or worse, he was out of his mind. Whatever the word or description, it would be completely irrational. That's how Paul describes the Galatians. But he knew these Galatians. He didn't think they were crazy. So the only explanation that he could give for their bizarre behavior was that they had been bewitched. It was as though some character like the, the, the fictional Svengali with his hypnotic eyes had entered their churches and put them under his spell. So the idea has been given, uh, explained here, of what he's saying is, who has put the evil eye on you? Who, who has hypnotized you? Now Paul, of course, is being facetious. But the Galatians' conduct was so preposterous that it was as though a band of sorcerers had entered their churches and cast a spell over them. But the law or legalistic systems are attractive to people. They naturally feel the need or the desire to do something to merit God's favor and blessing. They feel it's needed, and they desire to do that. So Paul asked, who has bewitched you? Well, this begins the next major portion of the book of Galatians in which Paul defends the gospel as the doctrine of faith against the false gospel of works. He's been defending his apostleship. Now he defends his message. Paul does that here with a series of questions. The first, who put a spell on you? which he, he follows with the statement, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Paul had taught the Galatians well. He explained the death of Christ to them so clearly that it was as if the crucifixion had been publicly portrayed to them, displayed on a billboard. They learned the meaning and the importance of the cross of Christ. He had taught them well. When Paul went to Corinth, he said he resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Because that is the essence of the good news of salvation. He didn't obscure the, the message, the gospel with non-essentials. He stayed with the essence of the message in Corinth, in Galatia, wherever he went. He made the message clear, which is the work of salvation is finished. Christ finished it on the cross, and there is nothing left for us to do but receive it. Nothing need be added. Adding to the gospel is like someone entering the Louvre in Paris with a Sharpie and scribbling a mustache on the Mona Lisa to improve it. It's, the, the, it's foolish. So to break the hypnotic spell the legalizers had cast over the Galatians, Paul asked another question in verse 2, which, if they answered it correctly, would prove his point. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by hearing with faith? Now he asks essentially the same question in verse 5. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit work miracles among you? Do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In, in other words, look back on your own experience. What works of the law did you do to receive the Holy Spirit that you did receive? And of course the answer to that is none at all. Just like Cornelius and his house full of Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, they were saved apart from the law through faith in Christ. Cornelius wasn't circumcised. He was baptized only after he was saved. At the moment of faith, 
He had the Holy Spirit. That whole company of Gentiles in his house had the Holy Spirit. He and they were justified. He had everything. And so did these, Gent these, uh, these Galatians. In fact, their reception of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, was confirmed with miracles. What greater proof did they need that salvation is through faith alone and not by the works of the law, not by the deeds that we do? They had the proof of their own experience. And so having begun with the Holy Spirit through faith, Paul asked them in verse 3, how they could imagine that perfection could be gained by the flesh. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you are now being perfected by the flesh? That is, by your own efforts? Being perfected here doesn't refer to sanctification, the uh, <clears throat> process by which the Holy Spirit actually changes us renews the inner man after the image of Christ and enables us to live holy lives. Paul is speaking here of justification. That's the subject of the epistle here. Ch justification of believers, their legal standing before God, what we have discussed in the past. It is the believer's position of righteousness before God, a position of perfection in God's sight. He sees us as righteous like Christ is righteous. Now, based on that legal position of forgiveness and acceptance with God, God promises to finish the work in the reality of our experience, in the reality of our life. He will glorify us and we will be perfected. But until then... And presently, the believer in Jesus Christ is considered by God to have Christ's righteousness and is fully accepted by Him. We stand before Him and in His eyes as perfect. Not because of anything we've done, but what Christ has done. And we're clothed in that righteousness. So Paul was asking the Galatians how they were going to complete what God had already completed. How they were going to establish a better standing with Him than the one that God had already given them. The Judaizers had come along and taught the Galatians that there were two steps to salvation. So this is how you improve upon things, they were saying. This is how you complete what's begun. We begin with faith. They acknowledge that. They preach that you must believe. You must believe in Jesus Christ. They seem to have been orthodox in that regard. But then they needed, they added something else that these Galatians needed to be circumcised. So their message was one of faith plus works. Paul answers, how foolish to think that we can add anything to the perfect work of God. It is one step. It is faith alone, which is really simply receiving God's work of salvation. Warren Wearsby was for years the minister at the Moody Church in Chicago. He illustrated the point from the experience of natural birth. He said, when a normal child is born, he has all that he needs for life. Nothing need be added. When the child of God is born into God's family, he has all that he needs spiritually. Nothing need be added. All that is necessary is that the child have food, exercise, and cleansing that he may grow into maturity. It would be strange, he wrote, if parents had to take the child to the doctor at one month to receive ears, at, at two months to receive toes, and so on. Well, that's really what Paul is getting at. We are complete at birth. We have everything we need, and we are sons of God at birth, full family members. Can't do anything to add to that. 
Just as a child is a son or daughter of his or her parents at the moment of physical birth, so too at the new birth we are God's spiritual children. We don't have to wait for some process to be completed before we become acceptable and accepted into God's family any more than a, a natural child has to do that. We are complete in every way at the moment we are born again. We can't improve upon God's work of salvation, can't do better than God has done in His grace. We can only receive it, receive Christ's finished work through faith. Now that's what the gospel is about. That's what the gospel requires. Faith alone, no additions. The Galatians had originally believed that confidently. We know they believed it confidently because Paul says they even suffered for it. That's what he says in verse 4. And, and in verse 5 he adds what, what we saw, that the truth was confirmed in their lives with miracles. So he asks here in verse 4, was all that in vain? Did you suffer so much for nothing? Were they going to lose the fruit that they had gained from suffering for the gospel by turning away from the gospel? God wants His people to profit from their experiences in life. We know everything works together for good. Paul assures us of that in Romans 8, 28. And all kinds of things come into our lives in various ways, various kinds of things. We pass through hardship. We pass through blessing. But it's all for a purpose, and that purpose is that we learn of Him and we grow in grace and knowledge. Our faith is strengthened. We are matured. We're blessed through the experiences of life that God brings to us. And God wants his people to profit from that, as I say. Paul didn't want these Galatians to lose what they had profited from. He didn't want them to lose all that they had gained. Didn't want this experience they had, specifically here, that of suffering for the faith, that of going through the trials that they had experienced because of their conviction in the faith to be in vain. And he didn't believe that it would be. He adds, if indeed it was in vain, and that seems to suggest from the apostle that it wasn't in vain and it wouldn't be in vain. They were true believers. He wanted to warn them of the consequences of the error that they were falling into, but also in doing that, encourage them to repentance, turning away from that by showing his confidence in them. Now, Paul could have ended his argument right here. After all, their own experience demonstrated how salvation occurs. But he didn't do that. He makes an even stronger argument from Scripture. Experience is very important. Experience confirms the truth. But Scripture is the truth. It is our authority. It is the source of, of doctrine. It is the ground of understanding. It is what gives us stability in life. And it settles the issue. And that's what Paul does in the next verses by turning to Abraham and the book of Genesis to prove that the Scriptures teach justification by faith alone, not by works. His reference to Abraham has been called a master stroke because the Judaizers looked to Moses for their authority. Paul looked back before the law to prove his point. Now, of course, God commanded Abraham to be circumcised and to circumcise every male in his family. Circumcision was important. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham and his people. But that's recorded in Genesis 17. Paul referred back to Genesis 15, to a time before circumcision was instituted, to an incident which is there, in which there's no mention at all of circumcision or ceremonies 
any kind of work. The only thing Abraham did was believe in God. And just as the Galatians received the Holy Spirit through faith, Abraham was justified by faith. Paul begins verse 6, even so, meaning even as you were blessed by faith, so was Abraham. He believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness or reckoned to him for righteousness or unto righteousness. In other words, Abraham's faith faith was, was reckoned by God or counted by him as the means or instrument to obtaining righteousness. We see this, for example, in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, where Paul writes, with the heart, a person believes unto righteousness or resulting in righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul speaks of the righteousness which comes from God, which is through faith in Christ. Faith is the channel, the means of coming and joining Christ and having the righteousness of Christ. Well, the two words that are important in Philippians 3, 9 are the same words that are important here in Galatians 3, 6 and Genesis 15, 6. Faith and righteousness, or believed and righteous. There are, there's no mention of works, there's no mention of circumcision or any ceremonies. Abraham was justified, he was counted a righteous man as a believer, not as a worker. Paul makes the same point in Romans 4 verse 6 where he states, God credits righteousness or God imputes righteousness apart from works. In other words, through faith to the believer. That's Paul's meaning here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. Abraham believed in God, and God reckoned his faith for righteousness, accepted it as the means of obtaining righteousness. The righteousness obtained through faith is the righteousness of Christ. God clothes us in his righteousness, so to speak. That's a good picture of it. It's as though we have white robes upon us without any flaw, without any wrinkle, without any spot. We're pure white. That's what clothes us. Yes, we're sinners beneath it. But he sees us in that way. as clothed in righteousness, and on that basis he accepts us as righteous in his sight. Again, nothing need, needs to be added to that. Abraham became right with God through faith alone. He was justified as an uncircumcised man. Now, if Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, didn't need to be circumcised in order to be justified, then Gentiles don't need to be. If Abraham was saved through faith, then all men and women and people are saved through faith. And so, in verse 7, Paul concludes that believers, those who are of faith, are the sons of Abraham. They are the true heirs of the promise given to Abraham, even if they are Gentiles. In fact, Gentile salvation was a promise that was given to Abraham at the very beginning. In Genesis 12, verse 2. And Paul notes that, he quotes it here in verse 8 to prove his point. All the nations shall be blessed in you. From the beginning... Gentiles have been in God's plan of salvation. And they would be saved the only way a person can be saved, the same way that Abraham was saved. So Paul draws the conclusion in verse 9 that those who are of faith, believers, are blessed with Abraham the believer. They are justified with him. You see the emphasis that he's putting upon faith, upon belief. They're declared righteous through faith alone. That's, that is the teaching of Scripture, which gives the, the positive proof for Paul's gospel being the true message of salvation. But Paul is not finished. 
He now strengthens his position further in verses 10 through 14 by showing the impossibility of being saved by the law. This is the, the, the negative side of his argument. Positively, Scripture teaches that we are saved through faith. Negatively, it teaches that the law can't save. It brings a curse. Verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of the law to perform them. That's a quote from the law itself, from Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, which states that the law requires that a person live by all things written in it. If you're going to be saved by keeping the law, you have to keep all of it. It requires perfect obedience for blessing. There's no room for failure. If a person fails in one point, he fails in at all. <clears throat> And he's condemned and cursed. No one can escape that. <clears throat> James taught the same thing. In James chapter 2, verse 10, he wrote, Whoever keeps the whole law yet, and yet stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. Well, that's quite a standard. You can keep all, or try to keep all 613 of those commands that's a rabbi countered them up, and that's what we tend to think is the number of all the commands, not just 10, but 613. Well, if you keep 612, but that one is a failure, the whole thing is a failure. That's what James tells us. The law is like a pane of glass. Break one part of it, and you've broken the whole thing. The whole pane is broken. So no one can be saved by law-keeping. Not because the law is bad. It's not. But because man is incapable of keeping it. Man is incapable of obedience. The perfect obedience that, that the law requires, that God requires, if that's the path you're going to follow. That's what Paul says in verse 11. He says, it is evident. It's evident from personal experience that we can't keep the law. Everyone sins. Everyone knows that if they're honest. It's certainly what the Scripture teaches. But it's also evident from the Scriptures because they teach that a person is justified through faith. And the Scriptures teach that clearly. <clears throat> now that's not only taught in the book of Genesis. It's not only taught <clears throat> in Genesis 15, 6, but also in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, which Paul quotes here again. He quotes, this is one of his favorite verses as well as Genesis 15, 6. And Habakkuk wrote, the righteous man shall live by faith. It's by faith that a person stands in a right relationship with God. That's different, a different way completely from law keeping. Paul shows that again in verse 12, almost redundantly. But again, quoting the law, and this time Leviticus 18, verse 5, he who practices them shall live by them. The condition that the law lays down for obtaining eternal life is keeping its regulations and keeping all of them. That is different from receive the gift of life by faith, and rest in the Lord. The two principles are incompatible. As Paul says, the law is not a faith. Faith and works are different in nature, as different as receiving and achieving are. <clears throat> like oil and water, they don't mix. And so we can't mix them and still have the gospel. The, the purpose of the law is to create a desire for righteousness. It's faith that satisfies that desire. It's the means of obtaining righteousness. So if a person chooses the principle of law-keeping to achieve righteousness and gain life, he will only fail and be condemned. 
The scriptures teach that. It's taught all through the Word of God in the Old Testament, throughout the law, and it's, the scriptures are very clear as well that salvation is through faith in Christ the Savior. Christ finished the work. Paul states that in verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's how he saved the lost and condemned. Redeemed us is a um, descriptive phrase. You've heard me and others use it, I think, many times. Redeemed means to buy, to purchase. And the idea is he delivered us from the curse of the law by paying the price and buying us out from under it. He paid the debt so that we could go free. And what, what did he pay? What was the price? Well, it was his own blood. What we will reflect on here in, in a few moments as we take the Lord's Supper. He became a curse for us. He suffered the penalty of the broken law in our place when he was crucified as our substitute in our place. Paul finds proof of that again in the law itself, in Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now that passage is about hanging criminals on a stake or tree to publicly expose their shame. And that was the cross for Christ. Though He was innocent, though He was sinless, He died the death that we deserved. He died our death. He died the criminal's death. Not for anything he had done, but for what we had done. For us, bearing the pain and shame in order to redeem us, Paul said. To pay the price that would gain our freedom and new life. And the reason he did it is given in verse 14, so that in Christ, Gentiles might have the blessing of Abraham. And we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, that really summarizes Paul's thought here. The blessing of Abraham, justification, is through faith. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is received in the same way and received at the same moment as faith. Through faith, we're justified, and at that very moment, we are sealed with the Spirit of God. Paul states that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, where he wrote, Having also believed, you were sealed with Him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the idea is when you believed, and when you believed, you were justified, you were sealed also with the Holy Spirit, all at the same moment and permanently. It all happens at the moment of faith. We are both fully and forever accepted by God as His sons and daughters. And we're not only accepted by Him, but we are equipped to live a life of obedience and growth through the Spirit of God. So He not only accepts us as His children and accepts us as righteous and perfect in His sight, there's nothing we can do to add to that, but He adds to us the Spirit of God to enable us to walk victoriously and triumphantly, to understand things that were foolishness to us before, but now with enlightened minds we understand the goodness and the grace of God. And Paul is addressing that new mind that they have to encourage them out of this error to which, in which they've fallen. Ceremonies and works of the law can add nothing to that. The way we began the Christian life is the way we continue it now and to the end. It is all of grace from beginning to end. We walk by faith, by faith, not by sight. Paul demonstrated that uh, first from the Galatians' experience. They received the Holy Spirit initially through faith, apart from works. Their experience of blessing proved salvation by grace. But secondly, he proved that from the Bible. Extensively, Genesis 15, 6 and Habakkuk 2, verse 4, both teach that faith is essential for salvation. 
The law teaches that a, a, attempting justification by works will fail. Justification by works brings not salvation, but a curse. Christ has redeemed everyone who believes in Him from the curse of the law. Because He took the curse in our place by dying for us. That's, what, that's, that's where salvation is found. It's found in Christ. It's not found in the law. <clears throat> so when we speak of the necessity of faith and the importance of faith, of faith and that God justifies those who believe, remember, it's faith in Christ. It's not simply faith. Everyone has faith in something. It's, something, it's faith in something very specific. In Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God become man who became our substitute bore the penalty of sin in our place, paid the debt fully for us so that there's nothing left for us to do, nothing left for us to, to pay. Think of the blasphemy of it to say, you didn't do enough. More has to be done, and I'll do it by keeping the law. No. Salvation is in Christ. It's not in the law. And Paul said in verse 11, that is evident. Well, it wasn't evident to the Galatians, evidently. But they'd been bewitched by the mesmerizing idea of personal merit, of, of achieving acceptance with God by doing works of the law. Men are naturally drawn to that idea of merit. It appeals to their pride. It appeals to their sense of... Uh, of what, what, what God would require, what they would require. People doing something to earn what they have. And so, they try to improve the gospel. They try to add something to it. Here it's circumcision. Other places it's baptism. All kinds of ceremonies. All kinds of added works. This idea of merit, it's a deception. The Bible is clear. The just shall live by faith. Abraham was justified by faith. That is the only way to life, eternal life. That is the only way to freedom. Freedom from the law's curse. And assurance that we are completely accepted to God at the moment of faith. What a, what a freeing thing that is. When you understand the significance of justification, that through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are declared righteous forever with God. We don't need to gain His approval. We can live our life for Him out of a sense of gratitude and thankfulness for all that He's done for us. What a, what a blessing that is. Salvation is free to the believer. We can't improve on God's work and shouldn't try. It is complete and we are entirely acceptable to Him at the moment of faith. We shouldn't be anxious about salvation. We shouldn't uh, try to strive to impress God and gain His approval and worry that oh, we may not do enough and we may lose it or whatever. It's not about our performance. We have everything we will ever need as a gift through faith. So may God help us to understand that and appreciate that. Understand the greatness of grace and live rightly for Him, obediently for Him. We must live obedient lives. That is true as well and just as important but we're to do it out of gratitude to Him for all that He's done for us. But if you have not believed in Christ, you have reason to be anxious. You're not acceptable to God, not in that condition. You are under condemnation. The curse of the broken law and the penalty of the cross still hangs over you, but you need to know this. Christ's sacrifice is good for everyone who believes in Him. So believe in Him. Trust in Christ. Enter into this great blessing of eternal life. May God help you to do that. And may help us to appreciate all that our Lord has done for us. 
So before we give thanks for the bread, let's remember that and, and give thanks to the Lord for all that he's done for us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for a great, this great truth that Paul, the great apostle, defended and explained with such emotion. He loved these Galatians. He loved them greatly, and that becomes all the more clear as this book unfolds. And so he has a kind of righteous anger about the error that they've fallen into, how foolish it was of them. And he wanted so desperately to bring them out of that. And I trust that that was successful because they, I believe, were believers. And while we fall into error, it's through such encouragement like this that the apostle gave such exhortation and admonition that we are brought back to the truth when we fail or drift. And so, Father, I thank you for the message that's given here. It's a reminder to us of the danger that we all face, that we can drift off into various kinds of error. And we need to look to you constantly and trust you and know that, uh, that your grace is sufficient for everything fundamentally sufficient for our salvation. It's all of you. Salvation is of the Lord. And that's certainly the theme that Paul is preaching here and throughout this great book of Galatians. Father, we thank you for the gift of life in your Son. And Father, prepare our hearts now as we take the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would bless this time, edify us, build us up in the faith, help us to focus on, on your grace and your mercy that was poured out on us through the shed blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Well, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let's stand and sing 53, Behold the Savior of Mankind. You're familiar, I know, with uh, that moving scene in the last chapter of the book of Luke in which two followers of Jesus are dejectedly walking down the road to Emmaus, saddened by the unexpected death of the prophet, as they called him, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God. So they walked along the road, sadly short of knowledge, uh, sorely short of truth, when suddenly the right person at the right time joined them on the road, but feigning ignorance of anything that concerned the two that day. But upon hearing from them the topic of their conversation and learning of their despair due to their having thought uh, the prophet was going to be the promised Messiah, the risen Jesus Christ mildly scolded them and then proceeded to open up the scriptures for them, explaining from them how it was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter into his glory. And Luke wrote, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Later, those two disciples would say, did not our hearts burn within us as we were walking with him on the road? And he was opening up the scriptures. Well, the content of that is what we remember. And uh, as we look now at the bread and the wine before us, that Jesus uh, saved us from our sins, as Dan has just explained, by bearing their penalty on the cross. And because of his infinite worth as the Son of God, the Lord God's wrath against us was satisfied. We were forgiven and given the gift of eternal life. And as Dan has uh, reiterated, we need nothing more. When Jesus said, this is my body given for you, and then this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins, he was asking the church in the future to especially remember his saving work on the cross in that way. Well, during this pandemic season, uh, stretching now uh, 14 months or so, uh, many of us have, have suffered. Uh, there's just no denying that. Uh, but there have been some side benefits 
And one is that more of our assembly have been engaging in this Lord's Supper and enjoying the blessings of contemplating our Savior and his work on our behalf. One of the foundational motivations of the men God used to first found this church was to follow the apostolic practice of the New Testament church in how the meeting of the church was conducted. And they looked at passages in 1 Corinthians and in, in the book of Acts, and they observed the actions of the early church and the apostles. The meeting when the church came together was spirit-led. Uh, there was much ministry of the word. Uh, there was an openness to the meeting that allowed members to exercise their gifts for the edification of the body. And every week, it appears, they partook of the Lord's Supper. And I'm sure there were many times that they felt their hearts burning within them. Uh, because of the ministry that took place as they, as they observed the Lord's Supper. It certainly happened in our assembly as well. Well, circumstances have affected how we have adhered to that the last several months, uh, but we're very near, we want you to know this, we're very near uh, returning to our normal practices, perhaps with a few modifications, but those principles will remain. In the meantime, and now, we have the privilege of remembering the Lord in the way he prescribed for us. So let me give thanks for the bread. Father, we are so grateful to be the body of Christ uh, solely on the basis of your son's work on our behalf. We have heard from the epistle to the Galatians that there is nothing that we have brought to this blessed relationship but our own sin and it is only the sacrifice of your perfect and holy son that has obtained for us the righteousness that we must have to approach your throne of grace and have the assurance of eternal life and so now we partake of this bread remembering uh, that Jesus uh, said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray in his name. Amen. Last week, we ended the sermon in Galatians with uh, verse 21 of chapter 2. And I'm going to read that uh, passage again because it shows from Paul's logic the necessity of the cross and the, the falsity of legalism, the very idea that, that we can be saved by ceremonies or works or anything. Paul wrote, I do not nullify the grace of God. That's what he was accused of doing by denying that we're saved through the law. He said, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. In other words, if there was another way for salvation through the law or whatever system one might want to construct, then the cross would have been unnecessary and God never would have sent his son into the world to suffer and die for us. He wouldn't have put his son through that if it were not necessary. The fact that he did, the fact that Christ did come and die is the irrefutable proof at the death of Christ, the God-man was necessary. The Father could not let the cup pass from His Son as the Lord Jesus prayed in the garden because there was no other way. Now that tells us a couple of things. It tells us how bad sin is and how lost we were that only God the Son could redeem us and do so only by a violent, bloody sacrifice at the hands of evil men. But he did it willingly. And that too is what the cross tells us and shows us. He drank the cup of wrath for us out of infinite love that he had for us. And we're to remember that. Let's give thanks for the wine 
that speaks of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the death of Your Son for us. We thank You for all that He suffered for us. We thank You for what this cup reminds us of, that uh, He shed His blood in a violent sacrifice that was necessary for our salvation. He was innocent, we were guilty, but He took our guilt upon Himself and paid the debt. And now, through faith alone, we're free. Thank you for Him and thank you for the sacrifice. In Christ's name, amen. Let's end with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep your eyes fixed on Christ, the author and perfecter of faith. And we'll see you next week, Lord willing.